Thank you, Preacher Mike. And had this choir and orchestra been fantastic, man, they have been so great. Thank you for the music and the hoppers. What do you say about it? I, I, I don't know. I had this crazy idea listening to the hoppers. I don't know where this is coming from, but I feel compelled to do this. I don't know what you all are planning this weekend, what you have on your calendar this weekend, but I want you to cancel whatever you have planned for Sunday and come to the First Baptist Church of Dallas Sunday morning. Then we'll have a citywide concert Sunday night and invite everybody to come. Is there any way you all would agree? Do you think that would be a good idea for them to cancel and come Sunday to the First Baptist Church? Will you do it? You hear them? They're going to do it. Isn't that great? Now, they were already scheduled to come this Sunday, but I was just making sure. No, I tell you, I'm grateful for the hoppers, but I'm even more grateful that Claude has some new jokes. So it's going to be great. Thank you. Thank you all. It's been great to get to meet some of you even before the um, service tonight, and some of you were very kind to say that you watch our program, Pathway to Victory, on TBN or some of the other stations, or you watch some of the things on Fox News and now Fox Nation where we air, and uh, you've been very encouraging, but I have to be honest with you, you know, being on television has its downside to it. Not everybody is as kind as you are. I was preaching in Washington, D.C. not long ago, and after the sermon, a guy came up, and he kind of gave me the once-over, and he said, you know, you're a lot better looking on TV than you are in person. <laughs> he was serious, but the worst one of all came not long ago. A lady called our 800 number for Pathway to Victory from another state, and she said to the operator, she said, you know, we like Dr. Jeffers' messages okay, but somebody has got to tell him he's got the worst toupee we have ever seen on television. I don't wear a toupee, so that was very, very painful. So thanks you, nobody, for saying that tonight. That was very, very nice of you. But you know, occasionally somebody will contact us with a more serious observation or question. Not long ago, a woman emailed our ministry, and she said, Dr. Jeffers, I'm 80 plus years of age. When I was nine years old, I trusted in Jesus to be my savior. But now I find myself waking up in the middle of the night, terrified that if I were to die, I would go to hell. As I approach the latter stage of my life, is there any way I can know for sure that I'm truly saved? For that woman, the question at that stage in life was not theoretical. It was very practical. Somebody has said, if the greatest joy in all the world is getting saved, the second greatest joy in all the world is knowing that you're saved. But is such a knowledge possible? Is it really possible to know whether or not you're going to heaven when you die? You know, some people say, well, I sure hope I'm saved, or I think I'm saved, but nobody can know that for sure, can they? And yet over and over again in the Scripture, the Bible tells us that God wants us to know for certainty about our eternal destination. In Hebrews 10, the writer says, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith. In 2 Peter 1.10, the apostle says, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. How can you know for sure that you're really saved? That's what we're going to talk about for the few minutes we have together tonight. And the best way to know whether or not you're going to heaven one day is found in one single verse in the Bible. If you have your Bibles, turn to the letter of 1 John. 1 John Chapter 5, verse 13. The apostle says, These things have I written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God in order that you may know that you have eternal life. Tonight I'd like to speak to you about what I believe are the five 
most important words in the Bible. Now, there are phrases or words, but the five most important words or phrases in the Bible. And the reason these are the most important words is because they answer the most important question, how can I know if I'm really saved? Now, I want you to write down these words because I want you to remind, remember them long after we're gone tonight. Because at some point, you're going to turn to this. Or you're going to be able to point somebody to this who wants to know whether or not they're really saved. What are those five most important words? The first word is no. K-N-O-W. These things have I written to you that you may know. You know, in our culture today, anybody who says they know something with absolute certainty is thought to be proud or arrogant. In our relativistic society, we say you can't know anything with absolute certainty, certainly not whether or not you're saved. To, be, to say you know you're going to heaven, well, that's prideful. My wife, Amy, and I met uh, when we were 12 years old. We met in junior high school. And at that time, Amy was not a Christian yet. She had grown up in another church, another denomination, but they didn't preach the gospel. And so we were in classes together, and our English class was taught by a Christian. It was a secular school, 3,000 students, but she was a Christian. And the teacher knew I was a Christian. And she wanted to be a witness to her class, but didn't want to get fired for doing so. So she would ask the class leading questions, and knowing I was a Christian, she'd call on me to answer the question. So like she would say, Students, do you think it's possible to know that there is a heaven and that you're going there one day? That was my cue to raise my hand. Oh, yes, Ms. Madison, you can know that you're a Christian, and then I'd go through the plan of salvation. That was a little routine we had worked out. Well, my wife Amy, then 12 years old, was seated next to me, and she'll tell you to this day, she, said, she would say, you know, when Robert would say he knows for sure he was going to heaven, my first thought was, who is this arrogant so-and-so who thinks he knows the answer to everything? <laughs> Fifty years later, she's asking the same question. <laughs> but that's another sermon. We'll get into that later on. I mean, she fell into that belief that nobody can know for sure. Why is it that people doubt they're Christians? Why do they doubt whether or not they're going to heaven? Sometimes it's the conviction of the Holy Spirit of God. As we talk for these next few moments, there's something inside of you that is going to create doubt of whether or not you're truly saved. That something is someone called the Holy Spirit of God. And he is speaking to you. John 16, 8 says, And when the Spirit comes, he will convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment to come. Sometimes it's the Holy Spirit's conviction that causes us to doubt our salvation. We doubt we're saved because, in fact, we're not saved. Another cause of doubt in the Christian life can be a contradiction of lifestyle. When we profess to be saved, new people in Christ, but we're living in a way that contradicts that profession. It creates doubt in our hearts. Some of you right now profess to be a Christian, but there is a secret sin in your life that you hope nobody finds out about. You're trying to hold on to your profession of faith, but you're also trying to hold on to your disobedience. After 40 years of pastoring, can I share a secret with you? You won't be able to hold on to both very long. You can't hold on to your profession and your disobedience for a long period of time. You'll either give up your profession of faith or you'll give up your disobedience. But you can't hold on to both. A third reason people doubt their salvation is because of the confusion of salvation itself. A lot of people have a man-centered view of salvation. They think you just wake up one day and say, you know what, I think I'd like to become a Christian. So I'm going to reach up and grab hold of God. And that's what they think salvation is, reaching up and holding on to God. The problem is, what if doubt or discouragement causes you to lessen your grip on God? Do you fall away from God? Ladies and gentlemen, salvation is not our reaching up and grabbing hold of God. It is God reaching down and grabbing hold of us. And when he grabs hold of us, he never lets go. 
John 10, 28, Jesus said, I give eternal life to them, and they shall never perish. No man shall snatch out of my hands those whom the Father has given to me. That's one reason people doubt salvation. They don't understand about salvation. No, over and over again in the Bible, God's word says he wants us to know that we're saved. That's the theme of 1 John. No, no, no. 1 John 2, 5, but whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. 1 John 4, 13, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. That great preacher of yesteryear, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, said one time, I am so sure of my salvation that I could grab hold of a corn stalk, swing over the flames of hell, look the devil in the eye and sing, Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Now that's the kind of assurance God wants you to have. These things have I written that you may know you have eternal life. Now, the second key word, that helps you know that you're saved is the word written, written. These things have I written to you. Now, this may offend some of you. I don't care because I'm leaving here in about 45 minutes. Mike can deal with it. (laughs) I don't know what you do at First Baptist Indian Trail, but if you're like our church on Easter, you sing Easter songs. And, you know, one of my favorite Easter songs, perhaps you all sing it here, is He lives. Remember that? I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. It is a wonderful song until the last line. And then the writer screws it up tremendously. Do you remember how he closes that song? Climax. You ask me how I know he lives. The answer, he lives within my heart. Really? If somebody were to ask you what is the best irrefutable evidence that Jesus who was died and buried according to our, for our sins was raised again on the third day and lives in heaven and lives for us, you would say the best evidence of that is some little warm fuzzy feeling you have in your heart that you know he's alive? What if that fuzzy feeling disappears one day? You know, I'm sure glad my salvation doesn't depend upon how I feel. Because I want to tell you, there are a lot of days I don't feel saved. In fact, to be honest with you, it takes me about five cups of coffee in the morning before I ever feel like I'm saved at all. Well, ladies and gentlemen, our salvation does not depend upon our feeling. It depends upon the fact that is recorded in the Word of God. And that's what John is saying. He says, these things I have written to you. Our salvation depends upon the written word of God. That's where we find our confidence. You know, in 2 Peter chapter 1, the apostle was writing his last letter. He was an old man by that point. Remember in verse 16, he says, For we want you to know, brethren, that we did not follow cleverly devised fables, When we made known to you the coming of the Son of God, what he was saying was, we didn't get together up in some room and just make all this stuff up. He goes on to say, but we were eyewitnesses to his majesty. We were with him on the holy mountain when we heard the Father say, this is my beloved Son, listen to him. You talk about somebody who had experiences with Jesus. Boy, Peter had them all, didn't he? But he said, as great as our experience was, he goes on to write, we have the prophetic word made more sure. He said, there's something more we rest our faith upon than our experience or our feeling. And then he talks about the scripture. He said, for no scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no scripture ever came about by an act of the human will, but men moved, carried along by the Holy Spirit of God, spoke from God. Peter said, it is the written word of God, the scripture, that is the bedrock of our salvation. It is the bedrock of our faith. Now, the real question is, well, how do we know it's true? (laughs) You say, Pastor, our salvation doesn't depend upon feeling, it depends upon fact. Well, how do you know what's in the Bible is actually true? 
A number of years ago, when I first started working with Fox News, one of my earliest friends there was the late liberal commentator Alan Combs. How many of you remember Alan Combs from Hannity and Combs and then his own show? He was uh, Jewish, and uh, early on he used to rake me over the coals, but then we became very good friends. And every time I was on his program, he would give me an opportunity to share the gospel. Every time. And I'll never forget, in fact, I was on his last show and got to explain the gospel. And uh, I remember one time, close to his death, he said, Pastor, and this was on national radio, he said, uh, Pastor, do you ever have any doubts about your faith? I said, no, Alan, I really don't. He said, well, why is that? Why don't you doubt? And I said, well, because my faith stands and depends on the Word of God, the Bible. He said, well, how do you know the Bible's true? And by the way, we've got 45 seconds before a commercial. So how do you know, convince us that the Bible is true? So I mean, I went through just real quickly, okay, the literary evidence, the scientific evidence, the uh, literary uh, unity evidence. I'm sorry, and I thought, no, this is it. I said, Alan, here's the way I know the Bible's true. Fulfilled prophecy. There's no other religious book in the world that has clearly demonstrable and verifiable prophecies that were actually fulfilled in time and space. You don't find fulfilled prophecy in the Book of Mormon. You don't find it in the Koran. You don't find it in any other book. But there are hundreds and hundreds of prophecies from the Old Testament that were fulfilled in the New Testament. That's how I know the Bible is true. Let me illustrate that for you. You know, uh, Peter Stoner, a mathematician, said... You know, we talk about the hundreds of prophecies about Christ in the Old Testament that are fulfilled in the New Testament. The truth is, there are really about 64 major prophecies. Peter Stoner, this mathematician, estimated what, are the, what is the probability, the chance, that one man in history, throughout history, one random man could have fulfilled just eight of those 64 prophecies. You know what the chances are? One in 10 to the 17th power. That's a 1 in a 10 with 17 zeros behind it. That's the probability that Jesus Christ just accidentally fulfilled 8 of those 64. Now, to put your mind around how big of a number 1 in 10 to the 17th is, let me illustrate what that would be like. Let's just say I brought preacher Mike with me back to Dallas tomorrow. He likes to eat at Papacita's Mexican food in Dallas. So let's just say I coerced him to come back with me to eat at Papacita's. And when we got back, we filled up the state of Texas with silver dollars two feet deep. Two feet deep, silver dollars. And I took one of those silver dollars and I put a black X on it threw it in that pile of silver dollars, and we mixed up the whole state. And then I put a blindfold on Preacher Mike. And I said, now, Preacher, it's time for you to work off those enchiladas. So we're going to do some walking. And I want you to walk all the way west to El Paso. And then I want you to go all the way east to Tyler. And then I want you to walk north to Amarillo. And I want you to walk south to Brownsville. And he's trudging through these... Uh, silver dollars, two feet high, go through. And at a random moment, I say, okay, Mike, stop. Reach over and pick up one of those silver dollars. You know what the chances are that he would pick up the silver dollar with the black X on it? One in 10 to the 17th power. Now, that's the probability that Jesus Christ accidentally fulfilled eight of these 64 prophecies, what do you think is, is the probability that he fulfilled all 64 of them by accident? We've got a word for it. Zilch! Nada! No chance whatsoever. That's why we know this book is come from God. It was not made up. It is not a myth. It is God's very breath that is spoken on these pages. And our salvation doesn't depend how we feel or don't feel. It depends upon the written word of God. These things have I written to you, okay? The third word I want you to write down. Five most important words. Third word is believe. These things have I written to you who believe. How do I know if I'm saved or not? It's whether or not I believe. In fact, in the New Testament, 
there's an inseparable link between belief and salvation. Acts 16, 31. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Paul said the Philippian jailer. Or John 10, 10. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live again. And then John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever what? Believes on him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Now, we know we have to believe to have eternal life. But what does the word believe mean? Do you agree with me? That's the crucial word, believe. We have to believe in order to be saved and have eternal life. But what does it mean to believe? This is where most Christians completely get it wrong. They think that to believe means to agree to a certain set of facts about Jesus Christ. They think to believe in Jesus means... Uh, to kind of believe uh, like you would in Abraham Lincoln. If I ask you the question, do you believe in Abraham Lincoln? Oh, yes, yes, yes. I believe he was the, um, born in a log cabin about the same time as Claude Hopper. Uh, born in a log cabin. No, 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 no. That was a cheap shot, Claude. No, I believe Abraham Lincoln was born in a log cabin. He was president of the United States. He signed the Emancipation Proclamation. He was assassinated by John Wilkes Booth. Yeah, I believe in Abraham Lincoln. No, no, that's not what the word believe means. You know, a lot of people believe <laughs> that it means the same thing as believing in Jesus. When they say they believe in Jesus, they think it means believing certain facts about Jesus. Yes, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Yes, I believe that he died for the sins of the world on the cross. Yes, I believe that he rose again on the third day. Did you know you can believe all of those things and split hell wide open when you die? Know how I know that? Did you know the demons believe everything I just said to you about Jesus? They believed that he was the son of God. In fact, when the demons spoke to him while he was on earth, they would say, uh, why do you come and trouble us, uh, O anointed one of Israel? They knew he was the son of God. They believed that he died on the cross for the sins of the world. They believed that Jesus rose on the third day from the grave. They believed all of those things. In fact, they believed those things more than you do. And more than I do. Because they were there. They were eyewitnesses to those things. But do you believe any demons are going to be in heaven because they believe those things? No! Listen to me, there is a big difference between believing about and believing in. To believe in the Bible, the Greek word means to depend upon, to trust in, to cling to, to put your whole weight upon. Let me illustrate it this way. You know, I've got this chair here. And I believe that this chair is capable of holding me, of sustaining my weight. I believe that. But is this chair supporting me? I believe it intellectually. Is it supporting me? No. I can kind of say, well, well, I believe it can hold me up, but I want to, you know, be sure so I can kind of rest part of my weight on this chair, but also keep part of it on my legs. Am I, is this, church, uh, this uh, chair holding me up? Is it uh, supporting me? No. It's my legs and a little bit of this chair. No, to believe, to trust in, to cling to the belief that this chair can really support me, I have to put my whole weight in this chair. And only then is it really supporting me. It's the same thing with Jesus Christ. It's only when we come to that point in our life, when we're willing to kneel before a holy God and say, God, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve your punishment. I realize I can't save myself, but I'm depending, believing in, trusting in what Jesus did for me, taking the punishment I deserve on the cross. I am trusting in that and that alone to save me when I die. And the moment we say that to God and mean it, we have the gift of eternal life. That's why John said, these things have I written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. And that leads to the fourth word, the fourth phrase here, who believe in the Son of God. Belief, listen to this, requires an object. 
you know, to believe doesn't mean to just this general belief. You hear this a lot in the media. People, oh, I have faith, I have faith, I have faith. I believe. What do you believe in? Well, I just believe. What do you believe? Well, I believe everything's going to work out okay. No, that's not what saves you. It has to be belief in an object. And he says there, belief in the Son of God. It's to believe that Jesus was the Son of God who died for my sins on the cross. That's what it means. We have to believe in the object. And frankly, our belief is only as effective as the object of our belief. You know, it's not how much, it's not how much faith you have. It's not the quantity of your faith that makes a difference. It's the object of your faith. You can have a tiny bit of faith. But if it's faith in a great object, then it sustains you. Again, let me illustrate this. You know, I can have all the faith in the world that this chair is capable of sustaining me. But if unknown to me, if the manufacturer, they had left out a few bolts, it doesn't matter how much I believe. It doesn't matter how sincere I am. If I sit down in a defective chair, I'm going to collapse. And there are a lot of people who have a lot of faith in the wrong object. They are sincere about their religion and their belief. But they are sincerely wrong because they place their belief in the wrong object. No, it is those who believe in the Son of God. And ladies and gentlemen, the Son of God has a name. He has a name. Have you heard this expression today and people saying it all the time? Well, you know, all religions worship the same God. They just call Him by another name. And after all, what's in a name? Everything. You see, a name represents the very essence of who a person is. Let me illustrate that for you. Let's say Preacher Mike had advertised for months that tonight, August 19th, 2019, we're going to have a guest preacher for our Monday night series, and he's special. Dr. David Jeremiah, that great preacher, is going to be here. Now, you all turned out well tonight. But if he announced David Jeremiah was going to be here, it'd be standing room only. And so a standing room only crowd, they turn people away to come here, my friend David Jeremiah. And so at the time for the sermon, instead of David Jeremiah walking up, I walk up. And I preach the message. And you all are polite. You try to hide your disappointment. But when I'm over, one of you finally screws up the courage and you come up to me and say, uh, Dr. Jeffress, is David Jeremiah okay? I said, well, yeah, I talked to him a couple of weeks ago. Well, is he ill? Well, not that I know of. Why, why do you ask? And you say, well, you know, here on the program tonight, it said Dr. David Jeremiah was preaching and, and you preached. Oh, that I say. Oh, David Jeremiah, that's just another name I go by sometimes. <laughs> sometimes I go by David Jeremiah. Sometimes I go by Joel Olstein. Sometimes I go by Al Sharpton. But it doesn't matter. We're all preachers. <laughs> no, names mean something. All gods are not the same God. People say, oh, Muslims, they worship the same God we do. No, they don't. Allah is the God of the Quran. Jehovah is the God of the Bible. Allah is an imaginary God. Jehovah is a real God. Allah has no sons. Jehovah has one son, and his name is Jesus. And Acts 4.12 says there's no salvation apart from Jesus. There's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. We must believe in the name of the Son of God, Jesus Christ our Lord. That's how to know whether or not you are truly saved. Now the fifth and the final word. How do I know whether I'm saved? Write these words down. Eternal life. These things have I written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know you have eternal life. How do you know whether you're saved? Simple. Do you have eternal life? That's how to know. You say, Robert, that is a dumb question. <laughs> That's a circular question. I can't know if I have eternal life until I die and find out do I have eternal life or not. No, listen, if you wait until then, you've waited too long. 
You see, eternal life is not a quantity of life. It's not a length of life. Did you know everybody is going to live forever? Doesn't matter whether you're a Baptist, Methodist, Jew, atheist, Muslim, everybody is going to live forever. Some people are going to live forever with God in heaven. Jesus said in Matthew 7, the majority of humanity will spend eternity in hell separated from God. But everybody's going to live forever. That's not what eternal life is about. It's not just about the length of life. It's about the quality of life. We experience, not after we die, but the moment we are saved. You know what eternal life is? Let me put it real simply. Eternal life includes having a hunger for God. Like Ms. Hopper talked talk about today. That hunger for the Word of God. It means looking forward to being with God's people. It means a peace in your spirit no matter what is happening around you. It means a contentment no matter what your bank account shows. It means a willingness to forgive those who have wronged you. It means a desire to spend time with God every day, not out of ritual legalism, but out of a hunger in your heart. That is what eternal life is. And if you don't have that, you're not saved. Paul put it pretty clearly in 2 Corinthians. He said, test yourself to see whether or not you be in the faith. He wasn't saying give yourself a Bible exam to see if you can come up with 10 reasons for the virgin birth of Jesus. He was talking about your conduct, the condition of your heart. Test yourself to see if you're really in the faith. You know, I believe in assurance of salvation. I believe in the security of the believer. But guess what? The eternal security of the believer only applies to believers. And I think we're trying to argue and give comfort to people that they're going to be in heaven who have no right having that comfort. Because there's no evidence in their life whatsoever that they have eternal life. Oh, oh wait a minute, Pastor. Are you teaching we are saved by our good works? No, not at all. But James did say... Faith without works is a dead, non-existent faith. You know, if I invited you to Dallas, and I said, I'd like you to see my apple tree. <laughs> I've got a beautiful apple tree, and I take you to the backyard. It's the springtime, and you look at it, and it's just dried up, withered, and there's not an apple anywhere. You'd say, Pastor Jeffers, I think your apple tree is dead. Well, I'm offended that you would say such a thing. Well, there are no apples on it, you point out. Oh, oh, that. Hold on just a moment. I get in my car, race down to Albertson's grocery store, buy some apples, come back, and I tie those apples onto those dead branches. Now, look at the apples. Now, apples do not produce life in an apple tree. Apples are the proof that there is life in the apple tree. Where there is no fruit, there is no life. And that's what James is saying. Where there is no spiritual fruit, there is no spiritual life. Martin Luther said it best about the relationship between faith and works. He said, faith alone saves, but saving faith is never alone. Where there is genuine faith, there's going to be genuine evidence fruit. That's why John says, Test yourself. Do you have eternal life? Are these things present in your life? Test yourself to see whether or not you are truly in the faith. I don't know if you read about this, but a few years ago, before Northwest Airlines merged with Delta Airlines, Northwest had a promotional gimmick one weekend. It was the most uh, imaginary thing I'd ever seen, imaginative thing they offered what they called a mystery fare. For $59, you could purchase a round-trip ticket. The only problem is, after you paid your money and went to the airport, you didn't know where you were going until you got to the airport. <laughs> you'd buy the ticket, and then you would get to the airport and find out where you'd been sent. <laughs> well, interestingly, thousands of people signed up for that mystery fare. And I can understand why, you know, $59, not that much money. I can afford to waste a weekend. I'm willing to take a chance. Thousands of people showed up. 
Most people didn't complain about their destination. There was one man, a reporter said, who was going through the airport waving his ticket. He said, I've got a ticket to Minneapolis, to the Mall of America. I'll trade for any other destination. <laughs> but most people were happy. Mystery tickets are fun. They're exciting. But there's one day of your life you don't want to be holding a mystery fare ticket. And that's the day of your death to face eternity without absolute certainty about your destination is a risk no sane person would take. These things have I written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know you have eternal life. Let's bow together in prayer. I'm going to ask nobody to leave. We're almost finished. Please don't leave. I'm going to ask our instrumentalist on the piano just softly to play. I don't believe it is an accident you're here tonight. I think God has brought some of you here tonight so that you can know once and for all with absolute certainty about your eternal destination. Maybe you're saying, well, Robert, I just don't know. I I think I made that decision a long time ago, but I'm not sure I understood. You know what? I've learned the best thing to do is not try to unravel what you may or may not have done in the past. Instead, right now, make absolutely certain you have done what the Bible says you must do to have eternal life. And so tonight, with every head bowed, every eye closed, tonight... If you want to be absolutely certain that God is going to welcome you into his presence one day, I want to ask you to pray this prayer silently in your heart to God, knowing that God is listening to you right now. Would you pray this with me? Dear God, thank you for loving me. I know I have failed you in so many ways. And I'm truly sorry about the sins in my life. But I believe what I've heard tonight. You don't hate me. You love me so much. You sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. To take the penalty and the punishment from you that I deserve to take from you. And right now, on this night of August the 19th, tonight, I'm trusting in Jesus and Jesus alone to save me from my sins. Thank you for forgiving me and help me to live the rest of my life for you. In Jesus' name. Now with every head still bowed, every eye closed, if you prayed that prayer tonight, regardless of what you've done or haven't done in the past, if you prayed that prayer with me tonight, would you just raise your hand wherever you are? Pastor Jeffress, I prayed that prayer. Yes. Many of you just raise so I can pray for you. Now I'm going to ask us to stand together with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. And Preacher Mike, I'm going to do something different tonight. I'm going to ask you to come and stand in the middle. Tonight, if you prayed that prayer, I'm going to ask you just to come down and touch Preacher Mike on the arm and say, I prayed the prayer, and then go back to your seat. We're not going to stay and talk with you unless you want somebody to talk to. Tell the preacher you want somebody to talk to. But otherwise, just come down and put your hand on his arm. Preacher, I prayed the prayer. You got it settled tonight. You say, well, why is it important that I come down and do that? Just taking those few steps will help seal that decision in your heart. So that in the days, the years ahead, if you ever wonder whether or not God has forgiven you, whether or not you're going to heaven, you can always look back on this night, August the 19th, 2019, when you tro told Preacher Mike that you prayed the prayer. So let's stand together right now. Our instrumentalist is going to play, and I'm going to invite you for your benefit just to come and tell the preacher I prayed the prayer. Would you do it? You come right now.
Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fpcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.